The upper right photograph shows quaternary lava fields near Albuquerque. Underneath is an artist's rendering of the climate and geography in New Mexico during the last ice age. The bottom right photograph shows a mastodon from New Mexico's ice age. Okay, now we're drilling down and we're going to be looking at New Mexico during the quaternary. And I want to point out, go ahead and hit your down button, there you go. Note that the illustration's timeline for the quaternary period has been expanded. Go ahead and hit it again, there you go. This is because the scale used with the rest would make the rise of humans too tiny to see. Keep this in mind as we continue looking at Terra during the Dunny era. Quaternary geology in New Mexico. In New Mexico, there has been significant volcanic activity during the quaternary. On the left, the map depicts all the volcanic features in the state using colors of red, blue, orange, and brown. On the right, the map depicts all quaternary volcanics in red. So that's the recent volcanic activity there. The two red features boxed in small yellow square at the bottom marks the location of Carlsbad Caverns. Um, and let's see, the other two yellow boxes show volcanic activity over the past 10,000 years since the Dunny arrived. So it was volcanically active in the state when the Dunny got here. Now note that the empty yellow square is nowhere near volcanoes. Um, they came to a, uh, the Dunny came to a geologically active corner of our world and at least three significant volcanic events to, uh, occurred in New Mexico after they got here. Yeah, go. There you go. These are quaternary changes in climate and vegetation in New Mexico. 20,000 years ago, it was much wetter and cooler in New Mexico. That's the upper left. With snow-capped mountains year-round, over the next 20 millennia, the climate became drier and drier, gradually progressing to the high desert we see today. To the right of the upper left, we see it as it was at 10,000 years ago or when the Dunny got here. The lower left shows it 5,000 years ago, and the lower right shows it as it is today. So the land has changed. It wasn't a desert when they got here. This one shows human evolution and migration. Here we bring humans into the picture. On the right, the chart shows the gradual evolution of hominids over the course of four and a half million years. Homo sapiens is marked at the top there with the red box. It, they show, we showed up only 200,000 years ago. We are barely a blip in the Terran timeline. The chart on the left shows human migration paths from our African homeland since the origin of our species. The Dunny arrived to one of the more newly settled areas of Terra. Humans had existed as a species only a relatively short time. Ah, this is, this is a fun one. The map on the left shows some of the earliest known human settlement sites in the New World. Most are in the range of 19,000 to 11,000 years ago and fit well with the prevailing theory that humans following mi followed migrating megafauna from Asia across the Beringer Strait up by Alaska when it was above sea level. These early inhabitants were hunter-gatherers, often living continuously at the same sites, so we know the New World was well populated by humans when the Dunny arrived. A fascinating and important exception to this is the site of Pedra Furada in Brazil, which shows evidence of continuous occupation from 60,000 to 42,000 years ago. There is strong evidence that these people did not emigrate through the Beringer Strait at all. The emerging pattern seems to be that Beringer immigrants wandered southward along the western areas of the continent and that an earlier non-Beringer migration settled on the eastern areas of the continents and spread north and south from there. The lower right image shows some cave paintings from Pedro Furada. Above it are the earliest known petroglyphs in North America, incised into some boulders at Pyramid Lake in Utah. These glyphs date to at least 10,500 years ago and possibly to 14,800 years ago. The projectile points are examples of Clovis at the top and Folsom below it, used by ancient Mastodon hunters here in New Mexico. As an interesting side note, the New Mexico petroglyphs from more recent times are pecked onto the rock surface rather than incised. This difference in technique most likely is explained by the relative hardness of the Pyramid Lake limestone with a hardness of three, that is, it's pretty, fairly soft stone, to the New Mexico volcanic basalt, which is, has a hardness of six. Next, 
The map shows a broad timeline of human occupation across Terra. Keep in mind that there is a di huge difference between human occupation and human culture. Although ancient hunter-gatherers certainly had skills and customs, such as napping projectile points beautifully, when archaeologists talk about culture, it tends to be a reference to the development of writing, architecture, sciences, agriculture, and the like. Culture, in this sense, flourished in the New World during the last 4,000 years. Photographs coming, yes, uh, show examples of this sort of culture in South America, Mesoamerica, and Southwestern United States. We're going from the oldest to the most recent. The middle, the, ooh. <laughs> Whoa. Go back. Go back. Can you back up a little bit? First one. Okay, thank you. Um, that's the Mayan city Chichen Itza in Mexico, which is dated 3,800 to 300 years before present. Next one. That's an Olmec head from Mexico dated 3,500 to 2,400 years before present. That's Tiwanaku in Bolivia, which dates from 1,600 to 1,000 years before present. That's an Anasazi settlement in Chaco Canyon in northwestern New Mexico, which dates from 1,200 to 800 years before present. That's uh, Toltec City Tula in Mexico, which dates from 1,800 years before present. And that's uh, an Incan settlement, Wine Huayna in Peru, dated 700 to 500 years before present. And the last one is an Aztec city of Tenochtitlan in Mexico, which dates from 500 to 200 years before present. And they were there when the Spanish arrived. They were flourishing. Okay. Yeah. True. Yeah, they didn't last long. <laughs> okay, this is part three, synthesizing the evidence. Here we're getting into the identification and analysis of all the clues we have so far regarding the cleft and Dunny Cavern location. Whether one only considers Rawa's comments about how the cleft is necessarily in New Mexico rather than Arabia, or whether one also considers the tree of possibilities and how it linked Renarap's descriptive book here to New Mexico, there seems to be something significant about New Mexico and some place in New Mexico that drew the Dunny here. So what might those things be? What sets our universe, our galaxy, our solar system, our world, and some place in the state of New Mexico apart from the other countless possibilities? What characteristics came together here that made it one of the best matches for Runeroff's description? Geological clues. Let's start with what we can find from the Dunny. When we follow Watson's quest footsteps, we see that there is water associated with the cleft caldera. So right away we know that there was a meeting of ancient magma and underground water, though the caldera itself is probably long dormant. There are a series of seeps at work inside the caldera itself as well as at the bottom of the cleft. Once underneath the caldera floor we find flowstone and an active river of water inside a small stalagmite stalactite cave. As we journey downward we are informed that the bottom of the great shaft is three miles below the Terran surface. When we reference Atrus the Elder's map, we can see that we are less than halfway down. Following the map, we see a magma chamber at a slightly higher elevation than the lake surface in the main cavern at about six and a half miles beneath the Terran surface. So we know there is water near the surface as well as six and a half miles beneath the surface, and there is an active magma chamber about six miles beneath. Next. Thank you. Now we're going to look at the geological clues. Sorry? Does somebody have a question? Okay. We're going to look at the geological clues from the surface. One of the most important geological features in New Mexico is the Rio Grande Rift. And I have a really long quote here, which I don't think I want to read. <laughs> can, can you summarize? Can I summarize? The LDR. <laughs> okay. It's basically talking about how it's a result of a couple of different plates and how they meet. Um, and it also says that the plate pressures seem to be steady and current, as in they are ongoing today. Uh, let me see if it actually says... I think that far in my different pressure. Sorry? Or six years. 
Um, let's get to the maps. Okay, that right there is a picture of the Rio Grande River, and there's just a general timeline of the rift formation on the bottom corner. Okay, the two maps. The volcanic line forms we saw earlier, and there's an aquifer uh, map there as well, which shows uh, basically the water deposits in New Mexico, and obviously it's following the rift. Um, upon first glance, when you see the actual Rio Grande, you know, it doesn't look terribly impressive. It looks like a bunch of puddles. <laughs> so uh, it's a little confusing. Okay, why is this, a, why is this an important river? Um, and part of this is answered when you understand that most of the water is actually underground, which I also think is going to come into play later as we get into more detail about where I think the cleft is. Um, let's see. When you look at the westward side of the Rio Grande Rift, you see that the west side is where almost all the volcanic um, features are. There's some up in the northeastern corner, and then there is... Hang on, let me see if this will work. Yeah, right there. That is kind of an anomaly. Uh, it's fairly far to the east from the Rio Grande Rift. Um, let's see. Yeah, good. The upper left shows a cross section of the Albuquerque Basin portion of the Rio Grande Rift. The Albuquerque Basin is marked on both maps with a cyan outline. There you go. I don't know if you can see it very well. There's one of them right there. There's the other one right there. It's pretty big. Um, it measures about six miles deep and about 30 miles wide. Six miles. Yeah. Okay, the last item of note is an inset on the volcanic map. There you go. Right there. Although it's not marked prominently, there is a cross-hatched area on the map toward the bottom of the Albuquerque Basin. This right here is basically the same as this right here. It's a magma body. This is the Socorro magma body, which is illustrated in 3D on the inset. The main pool of the magma body is 12 miles beneath the surface. However, there is a smaller pool only a few miles beneath the surface. It is uplifting slowly at a rate of about 2.5 millimeters per year and is responsible for frequent micro-earthquakes in that area of the state. Historical clues. We know from the Book of Atrus and presumably Catron's journals and perhaps Atrus and Anna's journals too that the cleft is located within a reasonable walking distance of a trade route. Back in those days, New Mexico was part of the territory known as New Spain that enormous portion of the Spanish Empire existing in the New World. All official trade was through the crown and done via official royal trade routes, or Caminos Reales. The official route that connected New Mexico to the seat of royal power in what is now Mexico was known as the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, the Royal Road of Interior Land. It's marked on red on the lower map there. El Camino Real, which connects the Baja Sur, or Baja Peninsula, south of California, to Sonoma, California, Oh, you, can't, you can't see it very well. It's in a cyan, kind of a blue, right along in there. And then there's this one here, too, which you probably can't see very well. And uh, that last one on the right-hand side is El Camino Real de los Tejas, stretching from Mexico City up to across Texas to Nachitoches, Louisiana. The Crown was responsible for providing safe passage to the official trade on convoys. Thus, soldiers always accompanied each expedition. The traders provided vital supplies to colonists on the route and collected goods and resources to take back to the vice royalty in Mexico City. Each round trip into New Mexico took about three years to complete via ox cart. That's a long trip. The map on the upper right shows settlements along the Rio Grande corridor that were serviced by these traders. The relatively large distance between stops toward the bottom marks a portion of the route known as the Jornada del Muerto this right here. The Journey of the Dead. Ah. This was a particularly hazardous part of the route, a significant shortcut away from the Rio Grande itself and its narrow canyons and occasional quicksand, but across a desolate and waterless stretch of desert. 
The photos on the left are from the last days of the active use of this trade route in the 1800s. The arrival of the railroads in 1881 made the old railroad obsolete after nearly 300 years of service. Zoological and botanical clues. The illustrations on the left show what has been identified as a zone-tailed hawk, along with the map showing its migratory territory. We see the spirit of the cleft riding the thermals when the day is sunny. Along with what we can observe for ourselves at the cleft, we have two known photographs of the location from the DRC records. The photographs in particular provide important information about the botanical species present at the cleft location. The landscape is dominated by sagebrush and snakebush, along with various grasses, which helps to narrow down the possible elevations for the cleft. The, the relevant elevation zone is marked in the upper right map in yellow. And you may not be able to see it terribly clearly, 